Salim, your audio is not clear, I think. Well, once again, good evening to all uh, my dear senior members and colleagues in the profession and respected uh, our own past chairman, Roy Vargis sir, and past chairman, senior sir, welcome to this today's session. Today is the wonderful session on the technology. Our profession is now leading to technological and technical session. More members are keen on understanding the new technology involved and evolving in the profession. Especially our new members are very much interested to know about the technology and the technical involvement in the profession. Unless otherwise we are in the mode of changing our professional activity to the to ways the technology it is very difficult to cope up with the practice. Today we have a wonderful session on the Decoding cryptocurrency and its way forward for our members. Today's session is handled by our young chartered accountant. I would like to introduce today's speaker to this session, Deviga S, a qualified member of Institute of Chartered Account of India and uh, Institute of Company Secretaries of India is academician by nature, captivated in teaching, training, conducting researches and publishing articles on areas of finance, market and economics. She has published the articles and given lectures and seminars at Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, colleges and the coaching institutions for chartered accountants across subjects including financial management, law and management accounting. She is guest speaker at the events of Karnataka C Association and Ethiraj College, Chennai. She has worked in global MNC and handled financial planning and the analysis and the cost analysis with the unit level financial statement of the de for decision making. She is currently associated with the South, uh, South Indian Bank as manager integrated solutions. Welcome to today's session. Over to you. Thank you, Salim, sir. Good afternoon. So here I am to handle the session decoding cryptocurrency and the way forward for our own dear members. To my audience from my previous study circle, I promise you there are things different and new for you. And to my new audience, it is going to be a long journey, a fun filled and a concept filled journey. So let's start. So we'll, be, we'll begin with the year 1970. So probably the 1970s was characterized with huge inflation, rising unemployment, huge interest rates in the market, and the situation was really bad in the economy. The central bank policy at that time was widely blamed for the irrational decision making it had done. Central bank irrationally increased the interest rates, making it difficult for people to access even their essential commodities. Now come again to 1976. So in 1970s, we had this experience. And in 1976, a book was published by the name denationalization of money and it was written by Frederick Hayek. You know, the speciality of this book is in this particular book, Frederick Hayek had suggested that we should take away the monopoly of currency from central bank. What do you mean by the monopoly of currency from central bank? In India, RBI is the only institution that is authorized to issue currency and control currency in the market. 
But what Hayek said in 1976 is that, no, central bank should not be given this monopoly. It is time that we took away this monopoly from central bank and we gave it to people. He suggested a decentralized concept of money. 30 years later, financial crisis of 2008-2007 saw history repeating again. There was huge inflation, there was rising unemployment, huge interest rate, and we all know the story of 2008 financial crisis. If at all somebody is asked who was the reason for financial crisis, they would straight away point their hands to a bank. It was the irrational decision making done by banks with respect to the real estate market, which led to this crisis of 2008. Once again, government's monopoly on currency was brought into question. But this time, it was not supposed to end just like that. Soon after the financial crisis set in, somewhere around in 2008, a post appeared on a less known forum. The post was titled, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. This was what the article was titled. The article suggested that banks and governments had too much power with respect to issuing of currency in the country. And this article suggested a new form of money or a new type of money by the name Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was known as a cryptocurrency or it was called a type of cryptocurrency. Now, at first this article was written by a person, Satoshi Nakamoto, but this person is not in existence. It was just a name that was used to cover up the identity of the author. Till date, we do not know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, but definitely Satoshi Nakamoto's article suggested a form of currency known as Bitcoin and this Bitcoin was supposed to be a cryptocurrency. Now, initially, nobody paid attention, just like what people did to Mr. Hyde in 1976. Everybody ignored this particular post. But few people started understanding what this post meant. And since now we are in a better technological era than in 1976, people actually started. In fact, few people started actually taking this article seriously. Since its publishing date in 2009, Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency market has grown and today it has 653 billion market as on 30th May 2021. And we have more than 10,000 varieties of cryptocurrencies happening in the country. So, why is that I should be bothered about something that happens in the whole world in the technological era? It is time that we paid attention to Bitcoin because cryptocurrency bank Kasha is planning to launch their banking operations in India for the customers for trading in virtual currencies like Bitcoin, which means the Bitcoin bank is coming to India. On the other hand, RBI is now looking forward to bring in a digital currency by the name Central Bank Digital Currency by this December. So what is happening in the country? If we need to understand what is happening in the country, we need to understand what is happening inside of Bitcoin. Or to be more precise, we need to understand what exactly a cryptocurrency is. So good evening once again. And welcome to my session on decoding cryptocurrency. So we'll start from here and we'll know what a cryptocurrency is and why RBI is trying to bring about a central bank digital currency and what is there in store for us. Now, before I start with Bitcoin, there is always a misunderstood term that Bitcoin is an electronic money. Bitcoin is a digital money. No, we'll just make things clear right from the start. Electronic money can be of three types. Money, which is kept online. Money, which is kept inside the cards, like prepaid money. And the third type is a virtual or cryptocurrency. Money that is kept online means the money that is kept in wallets like Paytm, Amazon wallet, etc. Those are money which is kept online. 
money which is kept inside the cards is your credit cards which we swipe in at places and the third form of money is the virtual or cryptocurrency and we will be focusing on virtual or cryptocurrency so cryptocurrency is not the only form of electronic money electronic money is already in existence in the form of wallets and credit cards but right now we are going to go one step ahead to understand cryptocurrency what is a cryptocurrency in simple words cryptocurrency is a form of payment and this can be exchanged online for goods and services like any other currency the speciality is it is decentralized and it is anonymous to a certain degree what is decentralized cryptocurrency and what is this anonymous cryptocurrency see you will have to wait a bit because i want you to understand a little more about cryptocurrency before i tell you what is decentralized currency and what is anonymous cryptocurrency now a common question that all of us would be having here is what exactly is bitcoin what is cryptocurrency and is there a relation between bitcoin cryptocurrency and what is this litcoin ethereum etc well, let me tell you cryptocurrency is the master data which means bitcoin is just one type of cryptocurrency just like litcoin ethereum etc bitcoin is also just one type of cryptocurrency out there see the reason why cryptocurrency and bitcoin is often used the other way is when the article was published by satoshi nakamoto in 2009 he or she that particular person used the term bitcoin to refer to cryptocurrency but bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency we have we have more than 10000 different currencies or 1600 digital currencies are available in circulation right now we have around 11000 cryptocurrencies actively running in the market in about 384 crypto exchanges so from now on if somebody asks you is bitcoin a cryptocurrency yes is cryptocurrency a bitcoin not necessary because cryptocurrencies can be of any type from among these but bitcoin is just one among the different cryptocurrencies available in the market now what is a bitcoin actually now just like we get some gold coins when we go to the jewelry shop on an akshay tritiya day is bitcoin some sort of a coin that we can hold it in our hand i would say please don't get fooled away by this images all these thai designs and thai symbols are just meant for presentation purpose bitcoin actually is just a software it is just a combination of protocols and processes so bitcoin is nothing like a coin that you hold in your hands but it is just a software a solved puzzle it is just a solved puzzle on internet these symbols and these presentations are just meant to convey the concept of a bitcoin but this has no reference to what a bitcoin actually is anybody can access and use bitcoins and if we see self driving taxis or uber vehicles as future of tomorrow even such vehicles could own bitcoins so if you want to take a self driving taxi you can make a payment in bitcoin to that taxi that taxi will be having a bitcoin wallet it will be accepting money from you and you can move on so bitcoin is just a set of protocols and processes now how does a bitcoin actually work so we will understand how a bitcoin actually works in the economy now when you google this particular concept it appears to be very very confusing the articles that give you details regarding how a bitcoin works appear to be very confusing at that time but let me tell you the concept of bitcoin is very very simple and it is something that we are using very much in our day to day life 
Remember that reward points that you get when you swipe your credit cards. Like if you make a credit card payment for every 100 rupee or 150 rupees, you get one or two reward points. Is this reward point equal to one rupee? Like if I say I have one reward point, does that mean I have one rupee with me? No. It means I have some reward points with me. The value of reward points could be anything that is decided by the issuer bank. Some banks may give you 20 paise, some banks may give you 50 paise, some banks may give you 80 paise. It depends upon the issuer bank. Now, what can I do with these reward points? You can either use it to purchase something or you can accumulate the reward points. You can redeem it into cash or you can redeem it into your bank account or you can use it for exchange of some commodity in the market. This is the same idea behind Bitcoin also. So one reward point is never equal to one rupee. It is much lesser than rupee. In certain cases, it might be just 20 paise or even a 30 paise. You can redeem these points at any merchant outlet as per your wish, or you can use it to purchase some goods or services. Now, that is exactly the way a Bitcoin also works. Bitcoins can be used to purchase goods or services. Bitcoins can be exchanged for cash, or you can just accumulate Bitcoins to store your wealth. It all depends upon what your purpose is. There is nothing a complicated technology behind Bitcoin. The working of Bitcoin is very, very simple, just like your reward points. But what makes a Bitcoin different is the characteristic features that a Bitcoin has. First feature, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is decentralized. Decentralized meaning there is no central authority looking into Bitcoin circulation in the economy. There is no central bank checking how many Bitcoins are available in the market. What are you doing with the Bitcoins? Are you using the Bitcoins to get some drugs? Are you using Bitcoins to pay for something legal, illegal? Nobody is going to look into that. There is no central server. That is, every data regarding Bitcoin movement is not available anywhere. There is no one single point where you can get all the data. The data is available, but it is spread across. It is maintained on a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. And there is no central storage. It has a distributed storage. Now, when it comes to a normal currency, you go to a bank to exchange currency, you keep your money at a bank, all your records relating to that particular bank account will be available with that particular bank. But when it comes to Bitcoin, these information will not be available at one central point. Instead, this will be spread across the area. Information is there. I'm not saying it is completely unavailable. It is available, but it is available with everybody. It is a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. Now, what exactly happens in a Bitcoin network? So before we understand what exactly happens in a Bitcoin network, we need to understand a little more about Bitcoins. See, in 2009, when people started accepting the concept of Bitcoin, a new era on how data is getting recorded, stored and shared was also born. See, earlier, how did we store data? We used to store data on floppy disk, CD-ROM, etc. or in our computers. You don't know whether this is the latest version of a particular file. Even in our audit offices, we used to have this trouble. Whenever a particular file is getting saved or whenever somebody is working on a file, you have no idea whether this is the latest version or if somebody else has kept another updated version of the same. Again, the second confusion, the second trouble will be, if at all you lose that particular floppy disk or pen drive or the hard disk, then you will be losing all your data or suppose if your computer crashes then again all your data will be lost but in 2009 
when Satoshi Nakamoto suggested Bitcoin, the group, because we don't know if Satoshi is just one single person or he or she is a group of persons. So we'll just refer to Satoshi. Satoshi suggested a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. That is simply known as Bitcoin at first. Bitcoin was actually a combination of two sets of technologies. That is Bitcoin consists of a blockchain technology as well as a cryptocurrency technology. So when I say Bitcoin, I'm not speaking about some money. As I told you, Bitcoin is a software. It is a set of protocols. Inside this Bitcoin or what makes this Bitcoin is a combination of two technologies. That is a blockchain technology and a cryptocurrency technology. So initially, blockchain as a technology was suggested in this article, Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. But today, if you see, blockchain has grown itself into a whole branch of technology. Not only for Bitcoin, blockchain is now used everywhere, even including our accounting field for the purpose of recording transactions. So from 2009, blockchain has developed into a separate branch of technology. But if you ask me, Bitcoin is supported or Bitcoin is a combination of these two technologies, blockchain technology and cryptocurrency technology. So if you want to understand what happens in blockchain, or if you want to understand what happens in a Bitcoin, we need to understand what blockchain technology is and we need to understand what cryptocurrency technology or cryptography is. So we'll start with one by one. So we'll start with blockchain technology. Okay. As I told you, blockchain was initially brought in for the purpose of Bitcoin. Thereafter, it became a separate branch of technology. In blockchain, records are being stored in a ledger which is existing in the form of a computerized database. To put it simple, in blockchain, your transactions will be a block. And all of these blocks are linked together. So this leaves an audit trail. Okay, so each transaction is a block and all these blocks are interconnected. So blockchain allows digital information to be recorded, distributed, but it cannot be edited. Okay, so if I record something here, and if you want to record something more, you can do it as a separate block, but you cannot edit my information inside this particular block. This is why blockchain technology is now getting accepted in accounting. Because suppose if there is a fixed assets, I made a purchase of fixed assets, I record that particular data in a blockchain, which means that purchase transaction cannot be edited by anybody. If you want to charge some additional expenses, you can put it as a separate block. If you want to charge some additions to the machinery, put it as a separate block. Each block gets added and these will be linked together. Unique feature is you can keep on adding particular blocks, but you can never edit a block which is already verified and kept. So that is a speciality when it comes to blockchain. You cannot edit a block once it is done. Now. Another aspect of blockchain or another aspect of Bitcoin is public-private key cryptography. As I told you, the second technology is cryptography technology. But before that, let us understand how a transaction works in a blockchain. So Bitcoin merely uses blockchain as a means to transparently record a ledger of payments because Bitcoins are used as a form of exchange. As I told you, cryptocurrency our cryptocurrencies are used as a medium of exchange. One word of caution, I will be using Bitcoin interchangeably with cryptocurrency. The reason is Bitcoin is the most famous form of cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency as a topic started with Bitcoin. So when I say Bitcoin here, it actually refers to the entire cryptocurrency. So we may not be mentioning as cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency. Instead, we will be using Bitcoin. So Please do not get confused that this is only meant for Bitcoin. No, any cryptocurrency, be it Bitcoin, Bitcoin, anything works with the same concept. Okay? So Bitcoin or cryptocurrency merely 
uses blockchain as a means to transparently record a ledger of payments. So Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency is a medium of exchange. You are exchanging this for goods or services. So there should be a tray of what you have used this Bitcoin for. That is ensured using blockchain technology. Now, Alice wants to send money to Bob. So that particular transaction will become a block. Okay. This block will enter a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. Peer-to-peer -peer means you have a lot of computers. Okay. We, five of us, or in this particular meeting, we, 20 of us, we will form a particular network. Okay. Each of us will have a computer. So this particular transaction, somebody wants to initiate this particular transaction. Somebody outside, some other outside person wants to initiate this transaction. So this transaction will come into our infrastructure or our peer-to-peer -peer structure. And we should be validating this transaction. All 24 of us, we should be validating this transaction. And if we approve this transaction, what happens is this block will be added to the blockchain with respect to that particular Bitcoin. And the transaction will be complete and money will be sent to Alice. Once again, we'll come around. Alice or one person wants to send money to the other. So this will become or this transaction will be represented as a particular block. This block is for sending money to Bob. Okay, so that becomes a block. This block will enter a peer-to-peer -peer structure. In that particular structure, the nodes or the network operators should be approving that particular transaction. So if we 24 of us, we form a network, all of us or the majority of us should be approving this particular transaction. So once it's approved, this block comes out and it joins the blockchain of or the blockchain pertaining to that particular Bitcoin. So there is a Bitcoin and this particular Bitcoin will be having a corresponding blockchain. So that block will be added to that blockchain and the transaction is considered as approved. This is what happens beneath a Bitcoin. So whenever a Bitcoin is transferred, this is what happens underneath a Bitcoin. And this is ensured using blockchain technology. Now coming to the second part of the technology, which is the crypto or the cryptocurrency technology. Now, if at all we have Googled something about cryptocurrency, then Google would have suggested that it is something which is difficult to be decoded. It is something that ensures that uh, your transactions are anonymous to maintain secrecy. That is what the first thing that comes into picture. See, yes, on one side, cryptocurrency is anonymous. But on the other side, cryptocurrency is completely transparent and trackable. Okay, sounds contrasting, but that is the case. On one side, cryptocurrency is entirely anonymous. But on the other side, it is a currency which is completely transparent and can be tracked. Let's see how this particular currency is considered anonymous. The anonymity of cryptocurrency. Why do we say that cryptocurrency is anonymous or it is something that nobody can see, nobody can understand? If somebody is sending some Bitcoin from next to me to the person next to there, I can never understand what is happening. Is it something that is happening in the dark web? No. The concept is simple. I'll let you know what the concept is and then you decide whether a cryptocurrency is completely anonymous as suggested by Google. See, the second technology that is cryptography technology, how is that particular technology working? See, cryptography, or why do we need cryptography? We'll take the example of two different signals. One is a signal that is given out by radio, radio transmission signals, the broadband signals or the television signals which is used by everybody. And on the other hand, you have defense communication, where the communication is supposed to be received only by the people in that particular mission. In this scenario, 
that is in the case of radio signals or in the case of television signals you don't have to worry about the privacy part because these signals are meant for everybody but when it comes to defense communication we need to ensure that the communication goes only to the persons concerned or only to the persons who are supposed to be receiving that information so how do you ensure that that is ensured using the technique of cryptography the sender that is a person who is sending this message will encrypt or hide his message using a type of key and algorithm okay let's not worry about the terminologies here what is a key but what is an algorithm we will be looking at it later but as of now understand whoever is sending the message will be encrypting or hiding the message the encrypted message is then given to the receiver the receiver will decrypt the message to generate original message okay so sender will encrypt the message and he will send it over to the recipient recipient will take receipt of the message and will decrypt the message to understand what the original message is okay so crypto in cryptocurrency actually refers to the cryptography technology so cryptography technology or cryptographic methods are used to maintain security or to ensure privacy of information what is cryptography in simple terms it is just a mathematical practice of encoding and decoding data i will encrypt the data in a way that i find it fit and you can decode the data if you know the mechanism that i have used or if you know what i am intending to communicate so it's basically a configuration based anonymity that is the way the message is designed that makes it anonymous so it's a design of the message that makes it anonymous so it's a configuration based anonymity the way you design your message that makes it difficult so if you design it in a very simple way and if any person can easily decode that message means your cryptography is not strong but if you de encrypt your message or if you design your message in such a way that the person has to sit and think okay what exactly should i do to get the original message which means your cryptography is strong Okay. so it's nothing a new technology it is something that all of us would have done okay just changing the design of the message in a way that sender and receiver could only understand so this will secure the transactions on the network it will control the generation of new currency units and it will also verify the transfers so that is the reason why we have cryptography technology as i told you cryptography is something that all of us would have used at least once in our lifetime the best and the most basic cryptography technique is the famous dialogue sadhanam kailanto so they go away to the airport and they just shout out sadhanam kailanto and whoever is the recipient if he is there he will be shouting out as sadhanam kailanto okay so that is an encrypted message and that is a simple form of cryptography so i want to send something and my recipient knows how i will be communicating so if my recipient is available out there he will give me the decoding code which is sadhanam kailanta okay so earlier cryptography was done using transposition ciphers so transposition ciphers means if you want to write something like green so green will be written as so i am just reversing the symbols here so green so whoever is understand like whoever understands my method of cryptography can easily decode it as green transposition this method is known as transposition ciphers you are just changing the position of digits or position of letters so by changing the position of letters you are trying to encrypt your message so our basic idea is whatever i am sending only the person who is supposed to receive it should understand okay so earlier we used transposition ciphers where we just altered the letters okay but today cryptography is performed using complex computer algorithms and mathematical technology 
you will generate a 256 bit long algorithm, which is your encrypted message. So the recipient on the other hand, the person has to find out what is the logic behind this 256 bit long algorithm. He has to find out the answer. He has to decode it. And only when that is done, the transaction will be complete. Okay, so earlier we started with simple transposition ciphers, but today we are using complex computer algorithms to ensure cryptography is done. But let me tell you basic principle right from Sadhanam Kairindo to complex computer algorithms remain the same. That is only the person who's intended to receive my message should understand whatever I am informing him. That is a basic idea behind cryptography. Now, let us understand what is a cryptography behind cryptocurrency. Because behind cryptocurrency, the cryptography that works is public key cryptography or cryptocurrency cryptography. In the terms may appear a little big, a little technical, but the concept is simple. See, all of us would have noticed this letter box which is available around the corner. Any of us can drop a letter inside this letter box. Okay. But can you access the letters inside the letter box? No. In order to access the letters inside the letter box, the postman has to come with the keys to this particular post box. Okay. So which means any of us can drop a letter inside but only the postman can take out the letters from this post box. This is the difference between a public key and a private key. This letter box is a public key, okay? which means if I tell you my public key, you can send me money. Okay? But if I want to access the bitcoins, then I should have my private key. Okay, so whenever I want to send, whenever I want to receive money from you, I will be giving you my public key and I'll ask you, please send your money to this public key. Okay, and once you've sent me the money, if I need to redeem this money or if I want to make a payment to somebody, then I should be knowing what my private key is. So public key is something that is available to everybody but private key is something that is available just for me. So if I want to make a payment, I should have my own private key with me. But if I want to receive my any payment from you, I can just give you my public key and you can send me money to my public key. Okay. So this is a simple idea behind public key cryptography. So public key means anybody can send money. Private key means Whoever is having the private key can only access the money which is available with respect to a particular wallet. Okay. Now, public key cryptography. A user will have both a public key as well as a private key. Okay. So every user using bitcoins or cryptocurrencies, he will be provided with two keys. One will be the public key the other will be the private key. So when I say public key, private key, please do not have a thought that it is going to be a four letter password, six letter password, no. It's going to be around 30 letters or numbers long. It's going to be an alpha numeric string of 30 to 35 numbers, okay? The purpose of public key will be to give people an address to send money to. As I told you, if I want to receive money from you, I'll just give you my public key. You can send me money to that public key. But the purpose of private key is to unlock the public money in order to receive the money that has been sent. Okay? So if I want to unlock my wallet and if I need to access the Bitcoin that you've actually sent me, I should be having my private key with me. But if you want to send me money, I can just give you my public key. You can send me money. Okay. In this public key cryptography, what can go wrong? Obviously, if people accidentally lose their keys, then there is no way you can get or you can access the money 
with respect to that particular private key. Remember at your bank, if you forget your internet banking password, or if you forget your mobile app password, all you do is forgot password, an OTP goes to your registered mobile number, an OTP goes to your registered email ID, you verify the transaction or verify the particular login from there, you get the new password, reset password, confirm password, password set. Okay, but that is not going to work in the case of cryptocurrency. If you lose your private key, then you are no way going to access the money which is available in the wallet with respect to that private key. Or if you reveal, if you just accidentally reveal your private key to somebody, then the person can access all money that is available inside the wallet. You cannot change your private key. Once a private key is given to you, it is intact. You cannot just say that, okay, just because I have, I have just spilled out my private key to somebody out there. Let me go and change my private key. That is not possible. Okay, so once you are given a private key, once you're given a public key, it is a unique key pair that should be maintained for you to access and use the Bitcoins that are available inside the wallet. Okay. So public key, private key, the key pairs are quite interesting, but the only threat or the only thing that can go wrong is if people lose their private key, then there is no way you can access the Bitcoins. You cannot break open a locker or break open and access the Bitcoins. It is not possible. So what if a person dies? The Bitcoin goes. That's a simple answer. Because if a person dies without revealing the private key to another person or to his relatives, then no way you can access the Bitcoins that he might have earned and he might have kept in his wallet. Okay. Now. So that was regarding the introduction to Bitcoin, how Bitcoins work. Okay. So to just sum up, Bitcoins are just like reward points that you earn, you can spend it, you can use it to buy goods and services. Okay. Now, Bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency out there. We have many different cryptocurrencies in the market, but Bitcoin is still the most famous one. Okay. And Bitcoin runs on two major technologies, blockchain technology and cryptography technology. Blockchain just ensures that whatever you do with the Bitcoin that is getting recorded. Okay? And cryptography or cryptocurrency technology ensures that whatever you do, it is encrypted. In the sense, there is no way that people can actually hack your account unless you tell them this is my private key. Okay, So that security or that privacy is ensured using cryptography technology. Whereas whatever you do that is getting recorded or a trail is created using blockchain technology. So when these two technologies combine a set of protocols or a set of process or a mere software is only a Bitcoin. Okay? It is not something complex or highly technical. It is just a simple software program. Okay. Now let's look into India's story of Bitcoin. What is there to look into India's story of Bitcoin? We just have started talking about Bitcoin. No, we started talking about Bitcoin right from the time Satoshi Nakamoto published his or her article on that forum. But it is now that we are actually knowing, okay, such and such things were happening around us. So let's see how India was dealing or how India is dealing and is going to deal with Bitcoin. So in 2008, as I told you, a paper titled Bitcoin Peer-to-Peer -Peer Electronic Cash System was published on an internet forum. Okay, So this was how the article was actually published. And this person, Satoshi Nakamoto, he just gave a summary, like uh, the main properties of this currency. I have been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. There will not be any third party. It is simply between you, me, and us. There is no central bank. There is no RBI looking into what we are doing. Okay. It will ensure there is no double spending. Participants can be anonymous. Hash style proof of work mechanism. Hash cash style proof of work. 
technical terms, but I will make it simple for you in Bitcoin mining. Okay. So he suggested a new electronic cash system that is fully peer to peer with no trusted third party interference. It is completely going to be between individual systems. Okay. So this happened in 2008. In 2010, the first purchase using Bitcoin was made. And the first item that was purchased was a pizza. So the purchase was to be precise made on 22nd May and worldwide every 22nd May is celebrated as Bitcoin day because that was a day when 10,000 Bitcoins was paid or was used by a man to pay for a pizza. So he paid 10,000 Bitcoins for that particular pizza. Okay. But today, do you know what these Bitcoins are worth? It translates to about 160 crores because today Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is worth 34 lakhs or around 45,000 US dollars. Around 45,000 US dollars. Translating, it comes to around 34 lakhs in Indian. Okay. That day, that is 10 years back, he used 10,000 Bitcoins to pay for a pizza, which is actually today worth 160 crores approximately. Now, BTC, to just confirm, BTC is the short term that we use to denote Bitcoin. Okay. BTC simply refers to Bitcoin in an exchange. So in an exchange, BTC is nothing but Bitcoin. So 10,000 BTC means 10,000 Bitcoins were paid for that particular visa. Now, so this happened in 2010, but in 2011, a lot of confusions came up with respect to Bitcoins. See, other cryptocurrencies began to emerge, including Litcoin, Mincoin, Swiftcoin, etc. But Bitcoin, Bitcoin soon came into controversy, stating Bitcoins were widely used for drug purchase, were widely used in narcotics purchases, gun purchases, equipment purchases. Mostly, these coins were heavily used in dark web. That is, uh, those were the allegations against Bitcoins. And to an extent, that was true. Because that era saw a huge use of Bitcoins for illegal purposes, like drug purchase and narcotics and equipment purchases. Bitcoins were used, which actually casted a shadow on the use of Bitcoins in the market. Now, come 2012 to 2017, Bitcoins or cryptocurrencies started gaining traction in the country, in our country. Cryptocurrency exchanges started to mushroom in India, including ZPay, Coin Secure, Eurocoin came up in the country. Along with the crypto exchanges, two major press releases were brought in by RBI. Okay. RBI came up with the first press release in December 24th, 2013, and the another press release came up in February 2017. So December 2013, RBI gave a press release, and in February 2017 also, RBI gave the press release, and both these press releases had the same story put in a different form. That is, RBI suggested that virtual currencies are not backed by a central government. Their value isn't underpinned by an asset and thus is a matter of speculation. But usually when we print currency or when we make available currency into the economy, we put up an equivalent amount of gold or an equivalent amount of asset against it. But when it comes to Bitcoin, it's purely buy and sell. It's purely demand and supply that drives the price of Bitcoins in the market. There is no solid asset against it. Okay. It's okay. I love to speculate. What is the problem if I deal in virtual currency? That is why RBI gave this particular sentence right in the beginning. That is, virtual currencies are not backed by central bank, which means you play with cryptocurrency, you end up in some trouble, 
please don't come running to me trying to say that I lost money while I was trading using cryptocurrency because I as a central bank am not recognizing virtual currency as a currency in my country. So that was the disclaimer of responsibility which RBI made in one of its press releases in 2013. The same story getting repeated in the press release even in 2017 February. But the story did not stop there. But all of a sudden, uh, in October and November 2017, two PIS were filed in the Supreme Court. That is, public interest litigations were filed in Supreme Court. One litigation asked government to ban buying and selling of cryptocurrencies in India, whereas the other litigation wanted the government to regulate the currencies in India. So two PILs were submitted in the Supreme Court. One was asking government to ban buying and selling of cryptocurrencies, whereas the other was asking government to regulate the currency. Because only if the currency is regulated, you will have a legal backing for that particular transaction. So government understood, yes, this is something people have started accepting. So it's high time that I also understood what a cryptocurrency is. So in November, in November 2017, an inter-ministerial committee was constituted to understand what a virtual currency is and the scope of such virtual currency in an economy like India. So things were going very smooth. So government had formed a particular committee and they were looking into the aspect of cryptocurrency. So people were having a positive approach. Okay, something is happening with respect to virtual currency. Let's see the future happening early. But all of that went off on April 6, 2018, when suddenly everything changed. RBI straight away issued a circular that prevented all regulated banks from holding or facilitating cryptocurrency transaction. So April 6, 2018 circular is very famous among the banking community because it is a circular that restricted all banks that are regulated by RBI from holding or facilitating cryptocurrency transactions. Now, with the coming of the circular, trading volumes fell by 99% and by August 2018, around 95% of jobs also vanished in the market because it was a total blanket ban which RBI had imposed. So the crypto exchanges which had earlier came up in the country faced an existential threat during this time. And when they face an existential threat, they were not going to sit idle. Several exchanges filed writ petitions in Supreme Court. And they were asking the Supreme Court to kindly take away this ban imposed by RBI. It was a blanket ban or it was a complete ban that was imposed by RBI on Bitcoins. Now, in the meantime, Remember the 2017 Inter-Ministerial Committee that was set up to study virtual currency? That committee was ready with their report and the report suggested that private cryptocurrencies should be completely banned in India. So, on one side, RBA had already banned all the regulated entities from facilitating cryptocurrency transactions and on the other side, the committee appointed by RBA recommended that the country put a complete ban on private cryptocurrencies. Now, the story was almost about to end here, but it is India and we know it's always a land of surprises. And that is the reason why March 4, 2020, Supreme Court in its landmark judgment struck down RBA's banking ban on crypto. Supreme Court suggested that the circular issued on April 6, 2018 was completely unconstitutional because RBI 
has no say when it comes to cryptocurrency because you yourself have said that you are not the regulator of this currency. In that case, how can you stop regulated entities from trading in a commodity that is not even regulated by you? In our country, there is a speciality that only if something is mentioned as illegal, it is illegal. As long as the same commodity is not written in words is illegal in the books of law, that particular transaction, that particular commodity will never be illegal. The same way, Supreme Court gave one particular answer to this. That is, cryptocurrencies, as you told, are not regulated. Yes, that's fine. But you have not classified cryptocurrencies as illegal in our country. In that case, or given that scenario, you do not have a valid reason to impose a complete ban on cryptocurrency, which means a currency market which almost went close to its deathbed came back to full power. Now, trading volumes actually increased 700 percentage between April 2020 and February 2021. Cryptocurrency exchanges, cryptocurrency transactions were happening in full swing. But there were still rumors of something or some particular ban coming in. And yes, the thoughts were correct. On January 29th, 2021, a second existential threat came into picture. Government said that it is going to introduce a bill to create a sovereign digital currency. Very good. Welcome. But that is not the problem. Simultaneously, government is planning to ban all private cryptocurrencies. So one side, government is trying to bring in a sovereign digital currency, that is sovereign or government-sponsored digital currency, and on the other side, it is planning to impose a complete ban on all private cryptocurrencies. What is this? What is that the government is looking forward to? Now, as Arnab Goswami rightly says, the nation wants to know where India is heading to right now. And if we need to understand where India is heading to right now, we need to understand what are the plans in store with our government. Plan number one, the cryptocurrency and regulation of official digital currency bill 2021. So Lok Sabha bulletin dated 29th January 2021 suggested that cryptocurrency and regulation of official digital currency bill is planning to be tabled in the parliament for discussion. Simply stated as cryptocurrency bill 2021. This bill tries to lay down the regulatory framework for the launch of an official digital currency and to prohibit all private cryptocurrencies. Okay, As I said, on one side, they are planning to launch an official digital currency, but on the other side, they are also planning to prohibit all private cryptocurrency. Okay, so Private cryptocurrencies may be like Bitcoin, Litcoin, etc. So these are the two spheres or the two dimensions of this proposed cryptocurrency bill 2021. This bill is still not available in public domain, so we do not know the intricacies of it. But still, we are trying to understand more about what government is actually planning to bring in. So we look at the first part. That is, government is looking forward to bring in an official digital currency. Okay. Before that, what is a digital currency? Digital currency means a currency which is digital. Okay, and a currency which is available in digital form. But the speciality here is it will be a sovereign currency which is available in electronic form. That is, it will be Indian rupee available in electronic form, or it will be US dollars available in electronic form, okay, or it will be pound sterling available in electronic form. It is some sort of currency which is some sort of central government or central sorry, central bank regulated currency that is available in electronic form. Okay. And it will appear as a liability on the central bank's balance sheet, which means even 
such digital currency will be properly backed by central bank's assets. Okay. So one of the major drawback of cryptocurrency is there is no asset backing. Okay. So that is now taken care of here. Right. Because digital currency or central bank digital currency will be appearing on the liability side of central bank's balance sheet. Now, will central bank digital currency be the same as cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Because that is the first confusion that all of us would have. Okay. So instead of coming there, let me give it to you here itself. That is what the government is telling us. Okay. And instead of going behind cryptocurrencies, wait over here. Let me create something on my own and let me give it to you. So before you give it to me, I need to understand whether this is what I actually expected. Okay. We'll take a comparison between cryptocurrency and central bank digital currency. See, cryptocurrency is not at all a currency. Okay. Just because we call it a currency, it is not a currency. It is not at all a currency. It is just a privately created asset. Okay. But central bank digital currency, as I told you, it is just money itself, legal tender existing in digital form. So it is actually money which is existing in digital form. Cryptocurrency has no intrinsic value. If you look at what is the actual value of cryptocurrency, no, there is no value associated with cryptocurrency. But yes, there is a value associated with central bank digital currency. And that is the reason why it is less volatile and it has greater security. Cryptocurrency is not backed by any sovereign authority or central bank. But central bank digital currency has the support of monetary institution. Now, RBI is planning to come with central bank digital currency. It means it is something that is backed by RBI. Now, cryptocurrency depends on blockchain technology. Here, we still don't have an exact idea regarding what is the technology that is going to be used. RBI is stating that it is planning to explore distributed ledger technology. That is, it is planning to explore something like blockchain technology. Okay, But we still do not have an idea regarding how exactly the storage technology will be. Cryptocurrency, it's purely blockchain, but here it will be distributed to a certain extent, but I think, in my personal opinion, I feel that the control is going to be with central bank itself. So any edi editing or any omission, all such kind of extreme power or the central server will be available still at RBI. Okay. Cryptocurrencies do not represent the liability of any central bank or government, but central bank digital currency, as I told you, it is backed by assets of RBI, and that is the reason why it will be appearing on the liability side of central bank's balance sheet. Okay, so if you think that RBI is going to offer cryptocurrency in the form of central bank digital currency, let me tell you one thing you are grossly mistaken. Central bank digital currency and cryptocurrency are two different concepts. I'll explain that in detail, but before that, we'll understand some more regarding central bank digital currency. Now, how will central bank digital currency help? Yes, it will increase the digital payments or it will facilitate the digital payments. So come lockdowns and COVID related restrictions, we have reduced physical cash transactions considerably. Okay. Earlier, even at the petrol pumps, we would have paid in cash, but right now we are trying to pay via card. Okay. Wherever we go, we're actually looking for tap cards even. Okay. So with even all these restrictions and all these safety protocols, there is an increased usage of digital payments. So what RBI is planning to give to people is the benefit of private virtual currency while avoiding the damaging social and economic consequences of private currency. Okay. You need private cryptocurrency, right? I will give you private cryptocurrency. Okay. 
but without the damage, without the social and economic consequences of private currency. Okay, so we, we would have always heard this at our home. Okay, instead of going and having it outside, let me make it a little more healthier for you. Okay, if you're going to have it outside, they're going to use some sort of oil, but when I make it for you, or when your mom or somebody else cooks for you at your home, it is going to be a healthier version. Maybe it might taste a little different, or sometimes it might taste a little lesser than the one that you will be having outside, but it will be healthy and with less side effects. Okay, that is the same logic that RBI also is putting forward. Okay, RBI is ready to give you all the benefits of private virtual currency, but let me give it to you. Don't go to somebody else. Okay, and let's not make it or let's avoid the damage, the social damage and economic damage that a private virtual currency might have on us. Okay, now. Another good feature when it comes to central bank digital currency is the need for interbank settlement disappears. Okay, so if I want to send money from here, I can send it right away. I do not need an interbank coming in between. Okay, so right now when we have a clearing check or a clearing process, which means you have to wait for 24 hours to get your fund credited if it's a clearing check. Because the clearing process or the interbank settlement process happens. So once central bank digital currency comes into picture, such interbank settlement requirement will be minimized. Okay. Now, how will payments with central bank digital currency work? Now. Payment using central bank digital currency will be the same way as a digital wallet work. Okay, that is, you may be using Amazon Pay, you might be using Paytm wallet, same way you can use central bank digital currency. Now, what is the benefit for RBI here? Instead of printing cash, the central bank can now issue fixed supply of digital money. It will say that, okay, let me make available some hundred crores of digital money into the economy. So instead of printing hundred crore worth of notes, it can simply push this money into the economy. So when RBA does that, there is a lot of savings in the form of printing cost and storing and distribution cost. Okay, So looking at it from the RBI's point of view, it will lower the spending of RBI on printing, storing, and distributing banknotes. Okay, so instead of holding physical cash, we can now hold digital money and we can send and receive money electronically. Okay. Now, obviously, the question will be will it replace physical money? Uh, you ask me a straight away answer, no. And it is not possible also. Okay. Digital currency can never completely replace physical currency. If at all digital currency comes into picture, it will be existing complementary with physical currency. Okay. It will not completely replace physical currency from circulation because you cannot do away with cash altogether. You will continue to use cash, but maybe the usage of your cash might come down. Okay? Maybe the acceptability of cash might come down. Okay? And there will be prevalence of electronic retail money in the market. So even today, now when you go to the market or now when you go to a particular store, earlier people used to pay cash and get the things, but today you can see many people using the QR codes. Okay, so I myself prefer to use a QR code rather than paying cash, okay, which has its own side effects because I ended up one day realizing that I have no money with me. Okay, so that happens. But today, if you go to a particular store, you tend to go with the newer technologies. Okay, so maybe if digital currency comes into picture, 
the prevalence or the acceptability of cash may come down, but you cannot remove cash completely because you cannot do away with physical money altogether. Okay. Is this a competition against cryptocurrency? No. Central bank digital currency is not a competition with cryptocurrency. It is not designed to be a competitor for cryptocurrency. See, cryptocurrencies are purely based on technology. Now, Bitcoin is purely based on technology. If you ask me what made Bitcoins so popular is because they are popular as a medium of investment. Okay. Am I using Bitcoins as a medium of exchange? I would say rather than medium of exchange, I am using Bitcoins more as investment vehicles or I'm using cryptocurrencies more as investment vehicles. But when it comes to CBDC, central bank digital currency, the purpose of digital, central bank digital currency is to use it as a medium of exchange instead of physical money. Okay, so CBDCs will essentially track physical currency. So can you use this as an instrument of investment? Can we use central bank digital currency as an instrument of investment? That we need to wait and see. We need to see how they are planning to design central bank digital currency and we need to see the acceptability and then we need to decide can we use central bank digital currency as a method of investment? Okay. But central bank digital currency is going to be a public good that is provided by the central bank. It's just a public good, just like railways are offered. Railway services are offered by central government or the nuclear services are offered by central government. This is going to be a public commodity or a public good that is provided by central bank but cryptocurrencies are more of investment vehicles than medium of exchange so when somebody asks you is cbdc the competition for cryptocurrency no cbdc is a different concept whereas cryptocurrency is slightly a different process okay now here comes a twist Remember I told you central bank digital currency and cryptocurrencies are never going to be the same. Central bank digital currency is a totally different concept, whereas cryptocurrency is a fully different concept. Now, this is where law is going to face the problem. Remember cryptocurrency bill 2021 plans to ban all private cryptocurrencies. I was emphasizing on that particular term. That is, there is a plan to ban all private cryptocurrency. What do you mean by private cryptocurrency? See, in India, when I say public, it means government owned. When I say private, it is owned by private individuals. Okay. Who owns cryptocurrency? Nobody owns cryptocurrency because cryptocurrency in itself is a decentralized currency which means my ownership is spread across individuals so is it a private cryptocurrency or is it a private cryptocurrency or is it a private currency no cryptocurrency or bitcoins are not private cryptocurrencies if you want to say about cryptocurrency you need to start talking about decentralized and centralized cryptocurrency when I say centralized cryptocurrency, it means that there's a third party that is facilitating the exchanges or exchanges, exchange transactions on the network. Okay. But when I say decentralized cryptocurrency, it is the one that runs on distributed ledger technology. So if you want to prohibit private cryptocurrency, then what is that you're trying to prohibit? Nothing. Because if it is Bitcoin that you're trying to prohibit, then very sorry to say to the lawmakers that Bitcoin is not a private cryptocurrency. And please understand there is no concept as private cryptocurrency. You can either call it as 
a centralized cryptocurrency or you can call it as a decentralized cryptocurrency because none of the private currencies are owned by any individual or it is not owned by private citizens okay because there is no ownership for cryptocurrency that is the main idea behind bitcoin the reason why bitcoin was brought into picture is to take away the monopoly of central government okay so now if you come and say you have a private cryptocurrency i am going to ban the private cryptocurrency you can take and ban anything but you can never ban bitcoin because bitcoin is not a private cryptocurrency okay so with this said cryptocurrency bill 2021 it is not going to ban bitcoin or it is not having enough weapon to ban bitcoin because the wording in itself is not correct now what the government is planning to introduce is a central bank digital currency which means government is just trying to give you money in electronic form and nothing more than that okay but cryptocurrency as a bank is cryptocurrency as a branch is going to be totally different from that of a central bank digital currency so if you try to bring in a blanket bank one fine day if you say that i am going to prohibit private cryptocurrency means please understand cryptocurrencies are not private assets they do not have an owner they do not have an issuer so even if you say you are banning private cryptocurrency i do not i as a bitcoin do not fall within your definition of a private cryptocurrency and i will continue to remain in the market right so that is india's journey through bitcoins but one more notification has come up which is very much relating to our field okay that is mca has recently brought uh, brought out a particular notification requiring disclosures to be made with respect to virtual currency transactions undertaken by the companies during a financial year okay so mca has mandated mca has now instructed all the companies to make this disclosure whatever profit or loss that is earned on transactions involving virtual currency the amount of virtual currencies or cryptocurrencies held okay the deposits or advances received by companies from any person for the purpose of trading or investing in virtual currencies or cryptocurrencies all these details should be mandatorily disclosed by the companies from the next financial year onwards okay so when we see all these developments we understand that government of india or even the rbi is not just kidding about cryptocurrency they are going to come up with something serious with respect to cryptocurrencies okay so that was a journey of india or india's journey through bitcoin okay now going to one of the topics which was widely discussed during my previous study circle meeting that is bitcoin mining so this thing found the attention or this particular topic grabbed the attention of many of my audience there so i thought let me explain further on bitcoin mining this time okay so how do i mine bitcoin if this is the picture that comes into your mind when i say bitcoin mining please do understand this is not how bitcoins are mined okay we are not mining bitcoins from somewhere we are going to solve puzzles and get bitcoins okay bitcoin mining is a process of verifying bitcoin transactions and recording them in the public blockchain ledger okay so remember the two branches or the two technologies associated with bitcoin one is a blockchain technology and the other is cryptography technology so keeping the cryptography technology aside for some time let us focus on blockchain technology okay so whenever you verify bitcoin transactions and whenever you record them in the public blockchain ledger i told you each transaction becomes a block the block will enter our network 
we will verify and when we say okay that block gets added to the particular blockchain and that blockchain goes on okay so the process of verifying bitcoin transactions and recording them in the public blockchain ledger is what is bitcoin mining okay can we do that yes if we have the required hardware and computer hardware and the computing power then we can take up bitcoin mining okay all that bitcoin mining requires is high end hardware and computing power the miner who first solves a puzzle will be getting the reward okay as of today bitcoin miners who solve a puzzle get a reward of 12.5 bitcoins so basically it's a puzzle if you want to generate a bitcoin all you have to do is just solve a puzzle okay and in order to solve that puzzle you need to be very very quick okay because a miner who solves a puzzle first will be getting the reward and in order to be quick you need to make sure you have the best possible processes and the best possible computing power with you okay now what is happening that is you wants to share that is beyond wants to share 10 bitcoins to jennifer okay she wants to share 10 bitcoins with the next person jennifer okay so transaction data is shared with bitcoin users from the memory pool okay miners have to compete to validate the transaction using proof of work miner who solves a puzzle first shares the result across the other nodes if maximum nodes grant their approval the block becomes valid and is added to the blockchain simultaneously the miner who solves the puzzle gets a reward of 12.5 bitcoins okay and 10 bitcoins associated with this transaction will be received by jennifer okay so what happens there is a transaction the transaction will enter the mining pool or the network as i told you that block will enter the network and within the network all of them will compete with each other to solve that particular puzzle because if that transaction has to be validated you need to solve a puzzle so all of them will compete with each other to solve that puzzle first the miner who solves a puzzle first will send the answer to the other persons on the network so the other persons on the network they have to verify whether that solution is correct and if maximum of us approve that answer, the transaction is complete and verified. The person gets the money and the miner who first solved the puzzle will be getting 12.5 bitcoins as a reward. Okay. So this is what happens in a mine. So transaction first enters a network. Miners, the people in that particular network, they compete with each other to solve it first. The person who solves it first will send the answer key the answer key across the network to verify because there is no central authority okay so there is no central authority to say that yes your answer is correct what i have to do is i should share my answer key with everybody else in the network they need to verify if my answer key and if most of them the majority of them if they say that my answer is correct then the transaction is verified complete I, that is the first miner who successfully completed the puzzle, will be getting 12.5 bitcoins, okay, and the transaction will be complete. Okay, so this is what happens in a bitcoin mining. Now, how how does a bitcoin mining happen? Okay, so to understand how the bitcoin mining happens, I have a small video for you to understand how a mine is okay so when i say bitcoin mine bitcoin mine it will be giving you a lot of pictures okay you might be actually confused regarding what sort of a mine is it an underground mine or is it something full of torch lights or something no i'll show you i'll show you a real-time picture of a bitcoin mine and thereafter we continue the discussion regarding bitcoin mine The 28-year-old college dropout turned a single Beezing computer into a lucrative crypto mining empire. 
what you're seeing here is the Enigma facility, which is the largest Ethereum mining facility in the world. And uh, it was an exciting time. It was years ago when we came here and, uh, and built this. And uh, now we're expanding, expanding further and further because the demand is growing and everyone is ramping up the capacity. If you have the money, you can always buy cryptocurrency. Last year, Bitcoin peaked at almost $20,000, or you can earn it by running a cryptocurrency mine, a network of computers that serve as the backbone of the crypto economy. What are these machines doing? So those, those computers are mining. They are mining cryptocurrencies, and they are validating the transactions on the blockchain, and they get a reward for that. So if I pay somebody for something, yeah. In a cryptocurrency, it's being validated potentially by one of these computers. Yeah, that's true. And when somebody makes that transaction, you validate it here in Iceland and you make money. Yes. How much does one of these cost to create? If I'm going to create one of these for how? One of these units. And how many are in here? In this one warehouse here? That's so. That is actually a Bitcoin mine. So if you're looking at something like a single computer or a single computing processor, then that is not the story. The story is whole more different. It's a big budget more impact. Okay. So there are tens and thousands of processes which are being kept, which are solving the puzzles. So you can imagine the amount of computing power that is required to actually solve a puzzle. So let us understand what happens in Bitcoin mining further. See, the puzzle is solved by varying a nuance. Okay, nuance is nothing but a unique. It, it is just a numerical value. Okay, that is. The miners are actually searching for this particular numerical value. Okay. So hash value. To make it simple. You will always have a target hash. Okay, there will be a target hash. And you have to generate a hash value, which is less than or equal to your target hash. You, in the sense, if you are a Bitcoin miner, you using your computer systems or computer processor, you need to produce or you need to generate a hash value that is less than the target hash or equal to the target hash. Okay. Target hash is the one that will be accepted for that particular block. I told you a block will enter the network. That block will be carrying a target hash. Okay. So what you have to do is with your computing power, with your techniques or whatever your processor supports, you should be generating a hash value, which is less than or equal to this target hash. Okay. And once you've generated that particular hash value, share it across the members on your network. And if they approve that, then your transaction is valid and completed. Okay. Hash value should be lower than a predefined condition. That is a target hash. So whichever block is coming inside the network, that block will be carrying a target hash. Okay. Suppose, for example, my target hash is 242251. This is a hash of that particular block that came in. Okay. Now, what you have to do is if you are a miner using your computing power, you should generate this 242251. You should generate 242251 or at least you should generate 242250. Okay, so if this is the value of the block that came in, you as a miner should be able to generate at least, at least a hash value that is close to or equal to this target hash. Okay, for this purpose, miners actually use SHA 256 hashing algorithm and they define the hash value. Okay. And the miners have to keep modifying okay, and repeat this function until you get closer to this target hash. Okay, so the block that came in will carry a target hash. You as a miner should 
keep modifying your computing power. You should keep modifying your hash value to generate a particular value, which is very close or equal to your target hash. Once that is done, then your transaction is complete. Okay. Now, was this difficult right from the beginning? Like in 2010 and 2011, when uh, Bitcoins came into picture, was this particular puzzle difficult right from then? No. Difficulty of the puzzle changes depending upon the time that is taken to mine a block. Okay. The more you take time, the more difficult it will be. Okay. For the MBA, we have computer assisted technique exam, CAT exam. Okay. CAT exam goes by this logic. This, the more time you take, that they'll make the questions less difficult. Okay, but if you solve the questions really quick, they'll put the next difficult ones. Same logic. So depending upon the time you take to mine a block, if you're taking very lesser time, then they'll come up with even more difficult one. Okay, it is very hard to generate the proof of work, but it is very easy for the miners to verify. Okay, as I told, to crack. That particular algorithm is the most difficult part. That is, someone should reach 242250. Someone should at least reach 242250. Okay. For the others to verify this, it is easy. Okay. For a person to reach 242250 will be the most difficult part. But for others to actually verify this, it will be quite easy. Okay. So remember, I told you the block enters and Somebody has to crack it, okay, and somebody needs a solution to this. The others will verify if majority approves, then the transaction is complete. So approval part is actually easy to crack in and to reach that hash value, which is close to target value is the most difficult part of it. Okay, and once majority of the miners reach a consensus, the block gets validated and it is added to the blockchain. Okay. And with every 2016 blocks, the difficulty level changes. Okay, that is within a gap of 14 days. Within a gap of 14 days, the difficulty level of the puzzle changes. Okay, so difficulty depends upon the hash target. As I told you, the block comes in with a target value. And difficulty of this target value will change every 2016 blocks, approximately every 14 days, the difficulty level changes. That is why initially, initially in 2009, 2010 time, all that we needed was a proper processor. We just needed a CPU or we just needed some amount of computing. But today you can look inside a Bitcoin mine, see the kind of computers that are there because the algorithm has reached that level of difficulty that it can now be solved only by these supercomputers. Okay. Now, hardware required for Bitcoin mining. So that person would have showed you this is a hardware that is required for Bitcoin mining. So earlier days, all that we needed was a regular processor. Our regular central processor CPUs were more than enough to solve the puzzle. But as I told you, Depending on the time that you take to solve a block and with every 2016 blocks, the difficulty level gets adjusted. Okay. So earlier the difficulty levels were easier, but now since the difficulty level has increased, we are now switching to graphical processing units. Okay. Graphical processing units is what we saw in the particular video. Okay. Those are more efficient than CPUs, but the major problem with graphical processing units is they consume a lot of electricity. Okay, so earlier, all that we required were central processing or uh, controlling processor units or central processing units, but right now we require graphical processing units. And one of the major drawbacks and one of the reasons why Bitcoin mining is widely criticized today is the kind of energy consumption that happens. So even in that video, you would have heard a roaring noise, some kind of a machine running kind of sound. That is nothing but the amount of electricity that is consumed by those machines. Okay. 
and that is one of the reasons why majority of bitcoin mines were happening in china iceland etc where cost of electricity is comparatively lesser that is why the mines are located at such isolated locations so as to consume the electricity consumption okay today miners use hardware called asic application specific integrated unit which is uh, which was specifically introduced for mining of bitcoin and other currency so asic is what we use today okay so you can if you go inside a bitcoin mine they will actually show you a chart how many asics are there how many asics how many gpus all the stats will be there okay how many asics they have how many gpus they have and what exactly happens in that particular mine okay the major benefit of asic is it will consume less power and it has high computing power okay so which means it will be doing less environment damage okay so lesser power consumption and better computing power means better contribution to the environment okay so miners are profitable when their cost of resources to mine one block is less than the price of reward because we know that the miner actually receives only 12.5 bitcoins for mining or for completing one particular block but for completing that particular block if he is consuming that much amount of electricity or if he is incurring that much amount of resources which means the mining process is not profitable for him mining process will be profitable only when the cost of resources to mine a block is less than the price of the reward Okay, so that's the reason why many miners today they are going for ASICs, application specific integrated circuit. Now, each time a block is mined, new bitcoins will be created on the network, and supply is limited. Please understand, bitcoins have a limited supply. That is, we have only twenty-one million bitcoins available in the market as a whole. Are twenty-one million bitcoins already in the market? No. In this whole world, we will be able to generate only twenty-one million bitcoins. Already, some seventeen to eighteen million bitcoins have already been mined. So, which means only two million more bitcoins are left to be mined. It is a fixed supply. The supply is fixed, and that is to twenty-one million bitcoins. Okay. Today, the reward that is given to a miner is twelve point five bitcoins, and this twelve point five will come down. That is, it is halved for every two lakh ten thousand blocks. That is, once you like once you complete two lakh ten thousand blocks, then your reward will be half. Okay, because bitcoins are getting to, I mean, bitcoins are going to get expired. Okay. That is, once the supply is done, or once all the twenty-one million bitcoins are mined, then you don't have any further bitcoins available. Okay. So for every two lakh ten thousand blocks, the reward that is available for a miner will be halved. Okay. So once the next threshold is reached, now from twelve point five, it will come down to six point two five. Earlier it was to twenty-five. Okay. From twenty-five, it came twelve. Uh, from twenty-five, it became twelve point five. Now, from twelve point five, once the next threshold is reached, it will come down to six point two five bitcoins for every block that is verified. Okay. Now, what is a mining pool? Just like we do a car pooling, mining pool is a method of sharing resources. Once you look into a mine. That is a Bitcoin mine. You can see that it is not easier to set up this particular mine. He told you it it costs some few thousands of dollars, okay, and some ten to ten thousands of machines are available there inside one particular mine. Which means individually, if you're trying to afford it, it may not work. Okay, so instead, what you do is bring in all your resources and let us create a mining pool. Okay, so we ten of us. We'll bring in whatever resources we have, and we will create a mining pool. Okay, so multiple nodes will share their resources to mine a block. So all of us together, we will try to solve a particular block. Okay, 
even if one person gets the right answer, I will be sharing the reward with all of you. Okay? So when the block is solved, miners split the reward based on amount of processing power they have invested. So you have sponsored two systems, you have sponsored five systems, and I have sponsored 10 systems. So once the particular block was solved, there will be a reward, and this reward will be shared between all three of us, depending upon the processing power each one of us have contributed into the mining of this Bitcoin. Okay. The pool members generate final hash value after the reward has been proportionately distributed among the participants. So once the reward has been proportionally distributed among the participants, then the final hash value will be generated and the transaction will be complete. Okay. So if you do not have enough resources, what you can do is you can come in, pull in your resources, form a mining pool and let us do the mining together and let us share the reward in proportion to the computing power that we have contributed. Okay. Now, so what is Bitcoin mining in short? Bitcoin mining is something that is performed by high powered computers that solve complex mathematical problems. It is just a solving of puzzle. It's basically solving your puzzle. The result of Bitcoin mining is twofold. Okay. That is when somebody sends Bitcoin anywhere, it is called a transaction. It ensures that double spending does not happen. That is same Bitcoin should not be used somewhere else. Counterfeiting should not happen. Okay? And miners are getting awarded in Bitcoins. Okay. So this is Bitcoin mining. It is nothing but a process of solving puzzle. Put, put it simple. We are just solving puzzle. And at the end of the puzzle, that is once the puzzle is complete, we will be getting a reward. The only reason is the puzzle is so difficult that we alone cannot do it. We need the help of some 10 to 1000 supercomputers to do it on our behalf. Okay. Now, what happens when all the 21 million Bitcoins are mined? See, when all the 21 million Bitcoins are mined, it means that supply will come to an end. Supply of Bitcoins in the market will come to an end. Does that mean that Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency comes to an end? No. It is just that supply is stopped. That is, all the coins are now available in the market. And with all the coins that are available in the market, you can continue to buy and sell. Okay. So as of February 24, 2021, around 18.63 million Bitcoins have already been mined which means another 2.362 are left to be mined and which are yet to be brought into circulation. Once those Bitcoins are completely mined, what do the miners do? Miners will be fully into transaction processing part. Okay, So they will no longer be awarded in Bitcoins. They will be awarded in some fees. Okay? So miners will not stop their activity after all the 21 million are mined. Miners will continue their activity, but all that they will be doing is they will continue to verify the transaction for some transaction fees. Okay, so if somebody tells you that after 21 million Bitcoins are mined, Bitcoin is going to come to an end. No, only the supply will be stopped or supply will be tapped out. But Bitcoin is going to remain there and it is going to be in circulation with this or with these 21 million coins. Okay. Now, what makes a Bitcoin different from that of a bank? Okay, because both are currency, because cryptocurrency and bank is also giving some sort of currency. But what makes it different? See, bank is open only for limited hours. Okay, if it's a bank holiday, tomorrow is a bank holiday, no bank is available tomorrow. But when it comes to a cryptocurrency, there is no set hours. You can transact anytime, anywhere. Okay. In case of banks, transaction fee is comparatively higher. Okay. But in Bitcoin, it is almost variable and comparatively lower. Okay. Depending on transactions, so depending upon the type of day, there is a variation in transaction fee. 
that is you will experience considerable delay on weekends or holidays when it comes to banks because if you are given a check a clearing check on friday uh, high chance that you will get it credited only on monday okay for bitcoin the transaction speed is 15 minutes to maximum one hour if the transaction is very very complex okay so the transactions high end complex also maximum it is going to take only one hour to complete the transaction in case of banks it is compulsorily or it is compulsory to record your kyc data okay whereas in the case of bitcoin anybody can participate not much of kyc required but many of the exchanges today are asking for customers kyc okay in the case of banks if you have a government issue id then bank account or mobile phone all these are your minimum requirements to start a bank account and start transacting in money okay but do you need these for bitcoin no all you need is an internet connection and a mobile phone you don't even you don't even need to have an identity of your own you can be a robot you can be a self driving car you can be a self driving uber anything it could be all you need is an internet connection and a mobile phone accounts issues what if something goes wrong if something goes wrong the first thing that the enforcement authorities look into will be your bank account okay government authorities can easily freeze and seize your bank accounts okay but in the case of bitcoin it is difficult for the government to track down and seize your account data i'm not saying that it is not at all possible but it is going to be quite a difficult task for the government to track and crack it open. Okay. So this makes a bank and a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency different from each other. So we can very well understand governments are certainly scared of Bitcoin. Okay. So that is the reason why even if you look into RBI's decision or even if you look into recent RBI circulars or recent action by MCE, they are actually scared of Bitcoin. Government is actually a little bit concerned with respect to Bitcoin. Okay. Primary reason is it is decentralized and it has no central authority. There is nobody responsible for this currency. It is purely a market commodity. Okay. If some speculation comes, price might go up. If some other speculation comes, price might go down. It's completely a market's own commodity. Okay. Currency is created in cyberspace by miners. Okay. So currency creation never happens. As I told you, Bitcoin is not something that you can hold in your hands. There is no coin as such to hold in your hands. It is just a set of protocols, it's a set of processes which are available on the cyberspace. Okay. See, what is our existing system? In our existing system, we have some currency notes which are issued by government. Okay. And these currency notes have a value to this because the government says that yes, these currency notes do carry a value. Okay, because for every currency note that is issued, government is having some equivalent asset maintained. Okay, central government through their monetary policy will be issuing or destroying money. Okay, central government or central banks give directions as to how these currencies can be transferred. Okay, so what happens is RBI knows very well how to track the currency movement. Okay, and dictate who profits from the particular movement, okay, how to collect taxes on it and how to trace a criminal activity. So RBI has every record. So how much of currency is released into the market? Okay. Then how much of taxes are to be collected on it? How to trace a particular criminal activity? Okay. But all of this control will be lost if you bring in a decentralized currency because there is nobody to actually have a control over that currency. Now, what is the Bitcoin system? See, Bitcoin system does not need the existing bank system. And I told you it is something that is available in the cyberspace. 
okay it doesn't need the existing system it doesn't need it doesn't need any law or regulation governing it okay what is happening in the system there are some computers which are solving some complex puzzle some bitcoins are generated okay and one bitcoin when it moves from one person to another it is getting recorded in the blockchain ledger and whoever records it they get bitcoins in return okay reward is also in bitcoin movement of money also is in the form of bitcoin okay it is stored digitally and it is passed between buyers and sellers so we can see that there is it is something that we cannot see we cannot touch we cannot feel some software by the name money is moving from one hand to the other there are some people verifying the movement and the people who verify the movement they are also getting paid in this software money and it is just the software money that is moving hands okay is there some physical asset backing it is there some value attached to it no it is completely something that is operating in cyberspace now if bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency becomes widely adopted what happens the entire banking system will become irrelevant and you know banking system in any country accounts for maximum volume of transaction and maximum employment also so jobs will be disappearing tax revenue will be lost and money transfer business will be affected as a whole okay so you cannot widely adopt cryptocurrency that's the reason why even when rbi was planning to bring in central bank digital currency that is never going to be a substitute for physical money it is always going to complement the existence of physical currency now what is the other side of bitcoin so now we were talking about the ease of movement the money changing hands there is no central authority everything yes that is there what is the other side of bitcoin central bank has always interfered with the money supply in any country be it us be it india be it zimbabwe wherever you go you can see that central bank has always interfered with the money supply in the country and sometimes this interference has caused a recession has created unemployment and even has given rise to widespread corruption and the best example of this is the financial crisis of 2008 okay and this is not the first time that people are actually going against the central bank it is not the first time that federic hayek said that monopoly should be taken away from the central bank no even the austrian school of economic thought dating back to 1870 when states said economic manipulation by central bank is not at all beneficial okay austrian school of thought states that central bank should not be allowed to manipulate money supply in the country beyond a point okay so yes on one side it is good that central bank is taking care of the money supply in the country but on the other hand the very same central bank is using this power to induce recessions to create unemployment to just support corruption in the country so to an extent yes central bank holding the monopoly of money is good but beyond a point it is not going to be beneficial for the economy so how do i buy bitcoin so layman's question how do i buy bitcoin what you can do is you can choose a crypto exchange crypto exchanges are available in the country you can choose a crypto exchange you can decide on the payment option you can place an order and you can select a safe storage option so you can choose coinbase okay choose buy select which coin you want to buy select for whatever money you want to buy be it a one time purchase or every day or every week pay using whatever credit card or debit card that is there to show you how many red coins that you are able to purchase and finally that can be stored in your wallet okay it is as simple as making an online purchase there is nothing more into it you can directly go to a proper exchange coinbase is one of the popular one a popular exchanges 
So would recommend Coinbase for that. So you can go to Coinbase, you can decide on the payment option, place the order and choose which storage option is right for you. Okay. So when I thought of that, I remember that I have not explained or I have not suggested storage options for you. Okay. So how do I store Bitcoin? Okay. So what is there to store actually, Denika? Because this is everything is software, everything is protocol. See, everything is software, everything is protocol, but still it has to be stored properly. Okay. Because I told you if you lose your private key or if you reveal your private key secret, I mean, accidentally to somebody, then you are going to lose all your Bitcoins. So, which means your Bitcoins are stored somewhere. Bitcoins are usually stored in a digital wallet. Okay. Digital wallet can be hardware based or web based that is it could be either stored online or it could be hardware based okay you can store it on your mobile device you can store it on your computer desktop or you can keep it safe by printing the private keys and addresses used for access on paper okay so you can either keep your coins on mobile device computer desktop or anywhere else where you feel it safe okay to be more specific storage options are of two types you can have a hot wallet. Okay. Hot wallet is otherwise known as online wallet. Okay. You can store your bitcoins online. That is on internet connected devices like computers, phones, or tablets. Okay. You can store your bitcoins online. But the problem here is your private key may be vulnerable in these internet connected devices because nowadays we know. Through internet, a lot of information is being extracted from our PCs. The moment we talk to somebody regarding okay, purchasing, at least the moment we start searching for something in Amazon, maybe we started searching for a bicycle. Every other website we open, we will have advertisements of bicycles coming in. Okay, so that is a kind of information extraction that is happening in the world right now so if you are planning to keep it online in some internet connected device there are high chances that your private key may be stolen okay though it is the most convenient way it may lack security okay so rather than hot wallet you can go for a cold wallet cold wallet means this is the safest option for storage okay that is it will be a small device that provides cold storage. For example, a pen drive. Okay, you can keep it inside the pen drive. That becomes a cold wallet. Okay, and that is nothing but a hardware wallet. You save your bitcoins inside a pen drive and keep it safe with you. Okay, that is as good as a cold wallet. Hardware wallets completely remove one's cryptocurrencies from the internet for storage in a similar way that flash drives remove information from a computer for storage of the computer. Like I told you, like a USB drive, like a pen drive, you put it inside the CPU, store all the cryptocurrencies inside that, take it back, and that is a cold wallet for you. Okay. Now, before you deal with cryptocurrencies or before you deal with bitcoins understand one thing the creator is an anonymous person till today we do not know who the satoshi nakamoto is we do not know if this is just one person or a group of persons okay the creators are just computer programmer or programmers the currency is completely digital and they are using some sort of methodology which, which is too complex. Okay. So though we have explained using mailboxes and other versions, now if you ask, yes, the methodology appears very much simpler for us, but it is complex for a layman to comprehend. Okay. Storage happens on users' computers. So if you lose your computer, there is high risk that you may lose your wealth also. Okay. So if your tab is lost, or if your tab crashes, if your laptop crashes, which means your wealth also crashes. Okay. Now, so before we come to the conclusion of this session, okay, I would like you to listen to a video of Mr. Frederick Hayek, which was shot in 1991. You can see Mr. Hayek suggesting 
Bitcoin or a decentralized cryptocurrency. You can see him suggesting Bitcoin or a decentralized cryptocurrency right in his video in 1991. So he had this idea way back in 1991. So I started with Mr. Hayek. So before I conclude, let me conclude with his video. After two or three hundred years of coins, all governments put their hands and stopped any further development. Governments said, must not develop any further. We are not allowed to experiment on it. Money has either become worse in the course of time. And what we have had since the development, where matters of government inventions must be on, must be abused. I direct the Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar, the gold, or other reserve assets. And I have come to the position of asking, has monetary policy ever done any good? I don't think it has. I think that it's done very hard. That's why I am now pleading for what I've called denationalization of money. How do you think that it would uh, work? Would with the major banks such as uh, Chase Mint having issued currencies or gold coins issued to uh, Howard. But governments can stop the distribution of money. So can how to stop that from opening accounts in Central? After all, in the modern world, there's the end line of the coins paid by the University of Portland. The credits and credit cards that were substituted. I think we can forget about existing money and existing coins, and we can be with a system of accounts which will displace money. Ah, that is, that's, a, that's a fascinating concept. Maybe the unit one day will be known as the Hayek. <laughs> then you can understand what he was referring to as a system of accounts, a decentralized currency is nothing but what we were discussing for the past 2.5 hours that is Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency. This man had suggested this concept years back in 1976 in his book and till 1991, he was emphasizing on the very same concept and it took us these many years to actually materialize this concept. So speaking about RBI and cryptocurrency, is RBI planning to come out with a cryptocurrency in the form of central bank digital currency? No. Central bank digital currency is not a cryptocurrency. But what RBI faces or what are the challenges that RBI is facing right now? See, RBI has to decide whether it is going to use this digital currency in retail payment or wholesale payment or both. Whether it is going to give a distributed ledger or a centralized ledger, as I told you, whether the ultimate control or the, the ultimate information rests with the central server at RBI or whether it is going to be a distributed ledger, whether it should be token based or account based, whether it should be directly issued by RBI or through banks and the level of anonymity that should be maintained. All these should be addressed by RBI before it comes out with a central bank digital currency. Okay, so in summary, if you are using Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, you are trusting your money to a complex system that you have no idea about. People whom you know nothing about. There are people sitting somewhere here, somewhere there, validating your transaction and confirming your transaction and you are transferring money to another person. And you are going to be working in an environment where you have limited legal recourse because RBI or be it any central bank till date has not officially recognized cryptocurrency. So you will be operating in an environment where you will be having a very limited legal recourse. So even if Bitcoin ultimately falls, I mean, ultimately fails, or if it is not going to make it in the long run, but I would say Bitcoin or any other minor version of Bitcoin is definitely going to have its own space in the financial history because Bitcoin today is more than a bubble and is here to say 
and it is going to alter the way we look at currency from now. From what Hayek started in 1976, what he suggested right from 1976, it is going to be practical from now onwards and we are seeing the first signs of it right from our country onwards. So with this, I conclude my presentation. I hope it was able to give you some insight into what is a cryptocurrency, what is a Bitcoin, and what central bank digital currency is all about. So thank you. And I am open to questions right now. Any questions? I think everyone is understood very much about the new currency system. Okay. <laughs> Or maybe it is also because a lot of the, the, the topics discussed or a lot of the concepts discussed was like for me personally, like Latin and Greek. <laughs> the, the complex system, like how you rightly said, you know, I'm sure it is going to throw open a lot of, hopefully, a lot of uh, opportunities, you know, financial opportunities and, you know, investment opportunities in the future. As how you rightly said, probably for the moment, it is not an accepted or an approved system. But I know very, very close friends of mine who are dealing with Bitcoins and uh, you know, blockchain in the Europe. And they're in fact making and minting a lot of money. Uh, and uh, apparently now also through a lot of these uh, uh, applications like Zaroda or so, I have mm -hmm. some clients of mine here who are already doing, which, which I, I am not very sure how is that even possible. So they, they tell me that they, the, the client is also requested to feed their Aadhaar number and PAN number. But still, but I keep telling them that it is not uh, you know, legally possible. How is that, uh, sir? I have no clue. Anyway, they have asked me for my pan and other. So I filled in and I'm already <laughs> doing some investments. I'm not sure how legally possible that is. But I think it is there for the future to stay. And it is already a, a wide range, wide you know, opportunity or something that is very, very keenly followed in, uh, in Europe and in the Western countries. So hopefully legal India will also legalize this, this concept very soon. So I'm sure it's going to be very, very lucrative. Of course, a lot of speculative, no doubt about it. But um, but it was for me, majority of the concepts you said, it, it went beyond my uh, head. But uh, no, I'm sure all our members are probably listening and getting equipped so that probably in a year's time or so, that once this is legalized, it is also an opportunity for us to uh, you know, advise our clients regarding such uh, you know, venues of investment and probably for our very well-off clients or for our well-off you know, members who would also possibly invest in. So I think, uh, you know, Devika, like father, like daughter, she is also presented very, very uh, elaborately. She presented very elaborately on the topic. She already did a session, uh, a study circle session headed by Roy uh, recently on the same topic, which also had a lot of participants. So I'm, I'm really glad and happy that Devika is here, uh, a new a new uh, comer to be frank in the CPE profession or to the CPE angle of it. But uh, it was really very impressive the way Devika you did uh, this session today. I'm sure the members would have deeply benefited, hugely benefited. Uh, members may also please feel free to raise any questions or we would like to unmute if a couple of y'all would like to have a word or so. Roy, sir. Roy sir is the person, in fact, who gave opportunity to Devika uh, in, in the first chance. Thank you, sir. <laughs> He's as usual. No? Uh, did a good job, I think. Uh, no doubt, I think. Probably because of uh, the topic, uh, there is uh, no question. There should have been more questions, I think. In, in fact, I think if uh, the people, uh, I mean, the members are uh, really involved in it, I don't believe, I think, uh, majority of the members may not be directly involving in, in uh, cryptocurrencies. 
hopefully in the future if it is a uh, if it gets some kind of a legal validity that can be no so i think they did a great job and uh, thank you sir i think you have become an expert on it thank you sir <laughs> And here, I think uh, one uh, our Ibn uh, Philip sir put a comment that uh, uh, I I people think you cannot run behind Bitcoin. No? <laughs> sir, uh, I think a lot of our members are also very well versed in the mutual funds and share market. So, probably Bitcoins, uh, you know, it is going to be very, very similar and parallelly running to this stock market. So I'm sure we will have to adopt to this kind of a trading as well in the future, sir. I'm sure a lot of youngsters, like a couple of the uh, very close people that I told that who are already trading in this are chartered accountants you know, who are now currently in Europe and all. Uh, members in, of the, uh, in uh, cryptocurrency? Yes, sir, in Bitcoins. In Bitcoins, Bitcoin, in Bitcoins yes. 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 And uh, they are, in fact, members of Ernaglum branch who are now placed and settled in uh, uh, Prague and uh, you know, Belgium. So they are all very well, well versed. And in fact, they have made a lot of money also, all youngsters. So it is, I think, a very lucrative. But of course, I also know people who have lost some money through yeah. doubt about it, no doubt about it. So it is going to be a market similar to that of a, a stock. Uh, so, kind of an, uh, so how closely you monitor, how closely you uh, watch the market and invest or reinvest. This is the game changer. So I think we'll conclude. Salim sir, over to you. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful session by our own Deviga. Thank you, sir. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, now the Ernaulam branch, a lot of people are very much interested in this Bitcoin and preferred currency. I think in future also we can make a lot of. S uh, Salim, I am just in the uh, chairman. You can say that now. Our, uh, one of our uh, our own student uh, got the second rank in the city set the second rank in the intermediate. No. Yes, yes. The the intermediate uh, for our classes in Arnaculum branch. Very, very proud that we've got our. And also for uh, the CA final, the uh, All India second rank holder, though not a member of Arnaculum branch, a Palakkad uh, branch student. Uh, she is an article of uh, Varman Varma. So she's got the All India second rank. So I think a lot of uh, uh, you know, good good uh, performances and achievements by our students of Ernaculum branch, students who have undergone classes in the Ernaculum branch. Back to you. Thank you so much for the wonderful session today. And in Thank future you, also, we will, we will do more session on this, uh, especially uh, we would like to have some workshop on this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the all the participants and my senior members. And we have uh, on 23rd, uh, 23rd and 25th, we have tax audit session and uh, 28 to 29, we have digital technologies. Thank you so much for the wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.